to close it by hand! Nothing! No movement! Nothing! Black! Boobar! What about the bomb wipes? Yeah! We can strap it to the doors and winch them up! Like McCaskill's crew! Status! Electrical fire. How bad? Too bad. Real bad. Bombardier to tail gunner. Right. We've just extinguished the fire in the radar compartment. Heavy black damage to the electrical system. Be advised. Over. Go right back there. Right. Please respond. Over. Radio still transmitting and receiving, but I don't know for how long. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is mash note. This is mash note. This is mash note. Over. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is mash note. This is mash note. This is mash note. Transmitting for fix. We will be Davy Jones. Davy Jones. Over. Captain, all radio facilities are out. We have A channel. VHF only. Again, A channel. VHF only. Copy, Spark. Switching to A channel. VHF. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Wing, this is Dragon Lady. This is Dragon Lady. This is Dragon Lady. 277, respond. Over. Copy, Dragon Lady. Go ahead. Over. We are heavily damaged from flak. Electrical fire in our tail section in four playmate of our condition. Copy, Dragon Lady. Damage due to flak. Electrical fire aft. Informing playmate. Over. Roger, Wing. Shutting down power until this fire is under control. Copy, Dragon Lady. Out. Gibbs! Cut power! Copy! Cutting power! Right! Find a place and get yourself secure! Captain, the fire is under control. It'll stay out as long as the power stays off. It's fighting us. Everything on this ship is electrical. That shell blast under the cockpit has everything shorting out on us. Sparking wires started it. We need power back to get us home. The wiring has got to be shredded. Gibbs! Sir! I need power back. Can you give it to me? Stand by, Captain. Power restored, Captain. Wing, this is Dragon Lady. We are preparing to ditch. Radio our position in Navy. Vanessa, what's our Navy position? Copy, I'm working on it. ETA, Lieutenant. Wing, this is Dragon Lady. This is Dragon Lady. This is Dragon Lady. This is Gibbs. Dragon Lady. My airspeed seven. indicator. It's non-functional. Airspeed is two seven zero miles per hour. Two seven zero. Dragon Lady. Two seven seven. Respond over. Lieutenant, our position, please. Copy. Wing, this is Dragon Lady. Respond Captain. over. Captain, our position. Wing, we are preparing to ditch. Copy, over. Captain, all radio facilities are out. Channel A, VHF out. I can't get it back. Copy. All radio facilities out. We have to cut the power. Gibbs, cut power. Copy. Install ditching braces. Open all escape exits and assume ditching positions. Prepare to ditch. Open all escape exits. Assume ditching positions. On my command, I'm gonna need power back. Copy, power back on your command. 270 miles per hour. The 
descending at 3,000 feet per minute. Level out at 500 feet. Prepare for 25 degrees of flaps when power's restored. Copy 500 feet, 25 degrees of flaps. We're at 3,500 feet and descending. One thousand feet. Nine hundred feet. Eight hundred feet. Seven hundred feet. Six hundred feet. Skip, skip by our power. Standing by. Five hundred and fifty feet. Skip power. Power restored, Captain! Stand by to cut engines two and four! Standing by to cut engines two and four! 25 degrees of flaps! 25 degrees of flaps! Cut engines two and four! Cut engines two and four! 300 feet! Do you see any swell down there, Lieutenant? Negative! 200 feet! I'm gonna put us down into the wind! 110 miles an hour, 100 feet. Here we go. Nose up. Nose up! Boys, Verdesi, Lloyd. Who do we have? Sound off. Wilcoxon. Gibbs present, sir. James. Lloyd. Verdeshi. Cody. Tancredi. Weaver. How you feeling, Sergeant? Still here, Cap. Do we have any morphine? Yes, sir. You get this man some morphine. Anybody have eyes on Patatucci, Larson, or Wright? Right to cease prior to ditching, Captain. You certain? Absolutely certain. James, sound that whistle. All eyes look sharp. Yeah. Here they know we're down. It'll be okay. They'll be coming for us. They'll be coming. What the crew of the Dragon Lady did not know was that on the island of Iwo Jima, a 22-year-old pilot and his crew would be coming for them. But that pilot, my great uncle, Royal, a. Stratton would never return home. Many young enlisted men came from small town America, places like Elwood City, Pennsylvania, where our veterans are revered and things still move a little slower, where family reunions, old timey guessing games, 
and favorite pastimes are still alive and well. For anyone who's lost a loved one in war, the emptiness left behind can resonate for generations. For my family, it was World War II. Many of us didn't know my great uncle, just the name, Royal A. Stratton. But the few still among us who did also reside here, in small town America. I didn't know it then, but going home is where my long journey began traveling back through time. 1924. I was born in Elwood on 1st Street. I had three brothers and three sisters. And Ruth and Ada and me are the only ones left. Ryle's my brother next to me, older. Enjoy being around him. He's my close friend. We only had one toy between us. <laughs> we had one sled, build a big bonfire, and sled ride all night with the whole gang. His orders from Dad was watch Ada, because <laughs> I was the smallest one. He got along with everybody. He's a good kid. He'd do anything for you. I'm at Roland School. We were in the fifth grade together. We went to a one-room schoolhouse about a quarter of a mile away. He was nice. We'd go out and sit on our, our swing on the back porch, and he'd talk about everything. He tried to date Kay. I knew Royal before Mary Ellen knew Royal. My mother's maiden name was Timmerman, so it was Mary Ellen Timmerman, and he was dating my Aunt Kay at the time. Well, I was going with another fella. Mary Ellen was her sister. I, I said, would you like to meet her? He said, sure. She kind of liked Royal, so she said, I'm going to have that guy. <laughs> that was it. So she started dating him. They hit it off, and here we are. <laughs> my mom, she was a spitfire. One time when my dad was supposed to pick her up at 7, and he wasn't there, and she left. And he came about 10 after 7 and asked where she was, and she says, if you're not here at 7, she's gone. She wouldn't wait on him. From then on, if he was going to be late, he'd call. And my grandpa, his dad, would say, I want to meet this girl that's having you call her when you're going to be late. And he was never late again. Well, he wanted to learn to fly. So he took lessons up at Newcastle Airport and learned to fly up there. It was about 100 yards north of where the present one is. The building is still there. He enjoyed flying. He, he came natural to him. It was a. Travel Air 2000. It was a biplane, two wings, open cockpits, powered by a 90 horsepower uh, OX5 engine. He was very gifted as a pilot, and I'm so proud of him, very, very proud of him. We all got along good in them days, in different times. We were moored over at Pearl City Landing. That morning, we were all awakened by the, the bombs going off. <laughs> 7.59 AM, that's when they hit. When they bombed Pearl Harbor, and they sunk the Arizona, and they sunk those other ships. And those men were in steaming oil on the sea, dying. The country rallied, but the country was different. I was at a movie at the Tivoli in Richmond, Indiana, when they closed down the screen, and the owner came on stage and told us that we had been bombed. I think we realized at that time that we were going to be in a long fight. I was studying for a final exam, President Roosevelt was on speaking about Yesterday, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, I didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor and never heard of it. 1941. Went to school, and when we got to civics class, our teacher had brought in this portable radio, and we listened spellbound. A date which will live in infamy. 
infamy, a word we'd never heard before. Then he turned to the Congress and he asked them to declare war, and they did. With the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Then we started looking where we could uh, enlist. There was quite a inundation of uh, people showing up at recruiting stations in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor. I enlisted out of Binghamton, New York. Roy was the only one that enlisted. My other brother and I got drafted. I signed all the papers and was sent to Camp Blanding, Florida, which was an infantry base. And I thanked the good Lord 20 times a day that I didn't join the infantry. I wanted to get in the action. Of course, we were just emerging from the Great Depression. America and tragedy comes together. The Depression had a great leavening effect. We were living in, in a quite different world. We had rationing, butter, milk, eggs, silk stockings. Consequently, a lot of people began to grow what they called a victory garden, and estimated 40% of the vegetables grown in America were grown in those victory gardens. And there were these drives. They needed rubber desperately. They needed scrap metal. And I saved tin foil and bundles and gave it to the collectors. As a matter of fact, some people began to give up, I know Rita Hayworth did, uh, to give up the bumpers on their cars to the scrap metal people. Honest to God. Everybody shared in, in the war effort. My mother rolled bandages, worked for the Red Cross in Oklahoma. My great regret then was that I wasn't a little bit older so I could actually wear a uniform. I wanted to do that too. I wanted to get involved. So I convinced my mother that if I joined the Navy under age, I would not be sent overseas until I was 18. Now, that was a lie, you know, but I was desperate. To, I wanted so badly to get into the service. It had to be fought. We were fighting Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo. The entire world was at war. These madmen had to be stopped. So you sign on and you do what you can. And so we are a nation that had a purity of purpose, and that was to eliminate evil in the world. My name is John Ray. Freeland C. Turpening. Walter O. Shepard. Milton Robbins. Mark Kishigal. Raymond Lee. Oral Westerman. John Misterly. Edward Getz. Lyle Ammenhofer. Jerry Allen. Earl Holloman. John Logan. I was in a 30-man cadre. He had sent us to Keesler Field, Mississippi, to set up quarters for a new squadron that was going to be formed. And it turned out to be it was the 4th Emergency Rescue Squadron. There were so many pilots who were shot down, and they didn't know whether they survived, or whether they were in the water for weeks. The 4th Emergency Rescue Squadron was formed when the Navy decided that they were spending too much time rescuing Air Force pilots. So the next thing I knew, I had orders to go through the advanced training school at Pensacola, learning to fly the PBY. We were talking about a, a consolidated PBY, which was a seaplane amphibious, it had landing gear you could land on. It was built so that you could land in water. Primarily, I would say the thought was rescue in the open sea. An airplane gets shot down, whatever reason you had to ditch. A PBY was one of the best airplanes for landing and picking up people and retrieving them. The tanks, just the wings, had a little over 2,000 gallon capacity all told with a couple of what they call Tokyo tanks or auxiliary tanks under the wing. We had one under each wing at 165 gallons apiece. But anyway, that gave us about 20 hours flying time. Our planes were built by Vickers in Canada. The Army designation for the plane was a OA-10A, OA standing for Observation Amphibian. But it's the classic PBY-5A. President Roosevelt they had what they referred to as reverse lend-lease, and they were a carbon copy of the black cats that our Navy had made history with. After we were graduated from Pensacola, we were designated naval aviators. We were then entitled to wear Navy wings and Air Corps wings. We wore our Air Corps wings all over our heart, Navy wings on the right side. After we were sent to Biloxi, Mississippi, Keesler Field, that's where we became a member of a crew. 
Most of us were pretty pleased that we were in a rescue outfit that was to save lives instead of taking lives. So we worked pretty hard at it, hard as we could. They quickly brought in enough personnel so that we had 12 planes, and that would make a squadron. And my pilot was Royal Stratton. I knew Royal Stratton real well. He was a dear, good friend, extremely excellent pilot. I can't say enough about his pilot ability. And a fine man. And he was tall for a pilot. I think he was about 6'4". When I was by him, we looked like Mutt and Jeff. <laughs> and then flew from there to McClellan Field in Sacramento, California. We went over with white planes, and they painted them blue to match the water, so planes flying above us wouldn't be able to see us. It was a Catalina, and we named it Prowlin' Puss. And we had a prowling puss on the side of the plane, and he's sitting drumming his fingers. It was a real good picture. We thought it was. My engineer, he came up with the name Super Duck, and he painted Super Duck on Super Duck. We called it the old lard ass. Took off at 90 knots, flew at 90 knots, and landed at 90 knots. Well, he just showed up one day and had the name on it. It was spelled P-I-S-T-O-F-E. When we talked to Stratton, he told us that that was French for flying boat. And he pronounced it pisto for something like that. It was a play on words, obviously. But the way it was spelled, it looked like pissed off, and everybody appreciated that. We kind of made history wherever we went. And if we ended up in the news in any way, they would blot that out. We waited there for our instructions to go overseas. John Garfield, a New York actor, all excited about the stage door canteen, told Betty Davis about it. It was made up, of course, of Broadway stage actors entertaining GIs, American servicemen, about to embark for the venture of their lives. And Betty instantly caught fire and said, this is the West Coast port of embarkation, and they're coming flooding through here, and they have nowhere to go. So there has to be a Hollywood canteen, and indeed, it happened. And they created this wonderful, wonderful place where the soldiers who were on their way overseas in the Pacific could stop and be fed by, you know, by movie stars, or be danced with movie stars, be entertained. The war was on, and my mother, one night she came home and she said, you're going to sing at the Hollywood canteen, and I got out on the stage and I sang, and they stood up and applauded. And what I realized is these young men, they were so baby-faced and young and courageous, and they loved everything they did for them, everything. We had the big bands playing there, one name band after another. Any that was in town at the time would be happy to play for nothing to our young military. And so there was some pretty great dancing done on the most crowded of dance floors. I got five hours liberty every night, and, and I would hightail it right over to the Hollywood Canteen, which was incredible. And I remember walking in one day, and there was the great, gorgeous John Garfield with his sleeves rolled up and an apron on doing dishes. And it was a sight that I'll never forget as long as I live. The boys wanted proof that they had been to the Hollywood Canteen. So I signed everything. I had to sign their best girls' pictures. Imagine what a privilege it was for me to be part of that. The barn held about a 1,000 GIs and a number of hostesses to welcome them. And finally, one night, they prepared for the millionth man to come through those doors, and he did. The place just absolutely erupted when he walked through the door. He didn't know he was the millionth man. By the time they closed in 45, they had served three million servicemen. Many of them, of course, never came back. So that was the last view they had of America and kindness and people trying to help them. My mom wanted to name me Royal Anne. Thank God she didn't. Dad said no. If we ever have a son, we'll name him Royal. So he named me Vicki Elaine. He was gone a lot when he was in the service, and he was home when I was born. And then he left when I was four days old, and that's the last we saw him. Then we did get instructions to go overseas. I had our aircraft blessed by a priest before I ever left the States. But I'm not Catholic. I'm an Episcopalian. 
But I asked each man if they had any objection to it. They said, no, sir. And so the airplane was blessed, and I have the St. Christopher medal on the wall here. It was glued to my instrument panel. We took off different days en route to Hickam Air Corps Base in Honolulu. That was a long flight. We lost a plane when we first went overseas. Nobody knows what happened. It gets awful dark as you keep going west. There's lots of water under there. Our first flight to get to where we were going to serve, we had to make it to Hawaii. But I remember we took off about 3 o'clock in the morning in Sacramento, California. And about halfway across, we got a radio transmission. It's all in code, of course. They told us to turn around and go back, that there was a headwind going to hit us, and we probably didn't have enough gas to reach Honolulu. They want us to return to Sa Zalkin, how far are we from Hawaii? 7.5 hours, set our current heading and airspeed. If we maintain total flight time, will be just over 19 hours. We've passed the halfway point. What's happening? They want us to turn around and go back. To Sacramento? That doesn't make any sense. Radar operator to engineer. How long can we stay airborne with those new Tokyo tanks? Over. We got about 20 hours total flight time, Chief. Over. Copy, Doc. Radio operator to pilot. Oh, it's a radio operator, go ahead. Lieutenant, we've been instructed to return to Sacramento. Over. Copy, instructed to return to Sacramento. Over. Return to Sacramento? Sir. I requested code verification. Transmitting party was unable to verify. Over. Copy, unable to verify. Japanese dummy transmission? Pilot to crew. According to my calculations, we are past the halfway point to our destination. Therefore, I will ask each of you to vote yay or nay, as to whether we return to Sacramento. Take a moment to consider. Over. Navigator to pilot, you flying by here again, Lieutenant? Pilot to navigator, first Lieutenant. And are my calculations incorrect? Over. No, sir. Your calculations are correct. Over. Navigator, please say again. Over. <laughs> Your calculations are correct. Over. Over. Repeat. And so we all voted, let's go ahead. And when we did land at Honolulu, we were in the air 19 hours and 55 minutes, as I remember. And our flight engineer later told me, he said we had about 15 minutes flying time left. So, but we were pleased we were there. From Winterfield, we went to a little spot in the ocean called Johnson Island. Orders, we finally got them after two or three weeks. We searched for General Harmon. He was an Air Corps general. Most of the time when we were searching for rafts, I was in the blister watching for it because radar wouldn't pick it up. And the radar on our plane was up high, so you couldn't shoot down with it. You had to shoot out. I don't think they ever did know what happened to that plane. We couldn't find any evidence of it anywhere. Even though we were all a bunch of young guys, we suddenly became men. And we left there and headed west again. From Johnson Island, we were sent temporary duty to Wajalane, Iniwetok, Bikini Atoll, and finally to Saipan. When we got to Saipan, officers and enlisted men both lived in tents in the mud. Wise guy me said, where's the hotel? and they say you're sleeping here. From Saipan, we had four flights in the squadron, A flight, B flight, C flight, D flight. Each were on one of the nearby islands, plus the headquarter unit in Guam. The B-29, those were the super forts. They started coming in. Those B-29s had enough bugs in them, plus the shot and shell from the Japanese gunners. It was the largest airplane to go into production during World War II. It was a beautiful airplane, flew beautifully, one problem, the engines, they overheated readily. We were losing a lot of them at sea. There were 20 crews in our squadron and of each of the squadrons assembled on Saipan. I must say that half of those crews were lost during the time we were bombing Japan. We'd go up to fly cover for them about 3.30 in the morning, as I remember. They had a long runway, 
and they were loaded to the hilt. And they'd come down that runway and build up as much speed as they possibly could. And right at the end of the runway was a cliff, and they shot over the cliff, and then they dropped. Once in a while, they would hit water and, of course, explode. But most of them managed to, but you could see their prop wash on the water. And then finally gain altitude and take off, make a straight beeline for Japan. It was horrifying because I don't think many of them were over five feet over the water when they took off. And it was hair raising to them, I'm sure. One of our jobs, be ready for pickups in case they did ditch. So we had Saipan and the Marianas, but the planes just couldn't make it back. Sometimes they wouldn't, but most of the time, they just couldn't make that total run to Japan and back. The Japanese aerial gunners were getting pretty good. They had plenty of practice with these super forts coming in, and that's when we attacked Iwo Jima. Why was Iwo Jima important? Because it was midway point from the Marianas to Tokyo. There were two things important about Iwo Jima. One, it was within range of Japan for fighter aircraft. P-47s and P-51s could reach Japan and come back. And it was an emergency landing ship for B-29s that carried 11 or 12 crew members. So it was a place of rescue for the B-29s. 150 of us got shipped out at one time. And i never forget it. The first sergeant came out, was giving us a pep talk. And all of a sudden, he stopped. said, you men are going to make history. And history we did. During the battle, there was 36 planes landed there. Now, the first one was on the 13th day. That left 23. It's almost two a day. And those 36 planes probably saved 360 lives because there's a minimum crew of 10. So they attacked Iwo Jima and finally got it. My wing of our squadron were assigned to Iwo and we flew rescue operations out of there. The island itself was about four or four and a half miles long and a mile and a half wide. And it was around 40,000 of us on the island. Life on Iwo Jima was miserable. We had no fresh water. They had a distilled ship out on the ocean. We drank distilled ocean water. That extremely fine volcanic ash was always in the air. Our only means of washing up, going into the ocean with the clothes on and all. Where our encampment was down right next to Suribachi, there was two crews to a tent. No floors, it was really kind of nomadic conditions. We'd spent six months living in the tents. Me and Holiday, the flight engineer, always slept in the plane, and Sam. But old Sam Zuck was a mechanic, he was a good one. So they assigned him to our plane. And so wherever we'd land, Sam was always going around working on the plane. Me and Holiday had been up most of the night playing poker somewhere. And Sam, he'd get up while me and the flight engineer was trying to sleep, and he'd start working on the plane. And he'd be hammering, and that plane is just like a drum. When you beat on the side, it reverberates. And the flight engineer told Sam, he says, Sam, why don't you knock that off? We can let that go some other time. But old Sam wasn't that way. Sam was conscientious. And Holiday, he said, Sam, damn it, I gave you a direct order to go back to bed. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. I laughed. Old Doc Holiday, the Western gunman, that was one of his relatives. <laughs> Well, I always doubted that, but I couldn't argue with him. <laughs> he, he was always good for a laugh. <laughs> we got eight new B-17s, and it was on Iwo Jima until the war ended. I was the radio operator on Bulge and Bessie. We would go and on standby offshore so that if a crippled plane come back, we had the boat on the B-17. We could do up a boat or give assistance and call a submarine or a rescue ship in to assist them. A lot of airplanes have ditched because of mechanical problems. A lot of them have made it too. Kind of luck plays a big part of that. My combat experiences began on March 7, 1945, when our squadron landed P-51s on Iwo Jima. We knew that there were Dumbos, PBYs flown by the Army Air Corps and the Navy on the way to Japan. 
The next group were the destroyers on top of the ocean, and the next group were the submarines. And yes, we knew that they were out there. We had code words for them. We named them something, and we used them. My father was Hiram Cassidy. He was a submarine commander in the Pacific, and he took command of the Tigron. When the Tigron was commissioned, Hiram was put in charge of the whole lifeguard rescue operation in the South Pacific. When the pilots were coming back from a mission, if they had been hit and couldn't get the planes back to base, then they would coordinate where they were going to ditch the plane, and the sub would come up as close as they could to them and then rescue the pilots and, and the crew. This work was uh, very dangerous because they were operating in enemy waters. V Square 10 was the plane we flew overseas. And it's got a name, Abroad with 11 Yanks. You know, flying missions is kind of a harrowing experience. There's 1,500 to 1,700 miles between Saipan and the target area of Japan. And as far as we knew, there's nothing between us but open ocean. We were on our way to the target when the propeller ran away, ran at high speed, and we were not able to control it. So we headed for the island of Agrahan. Just before we got there, fire broke out on the engine. And when fire broke out, we bailed out. We were at 3,000 feet at 3 o'clock in the morning over the wide Pacific Ocean, but at least with an island visible to us. I'm sure we were all hanging in our parachutes when the plane exploded and crashed into the island of Agrahan. Well after daylight, a PBY flying boat flew over. Little did I know that they had been alerted and they came to search for us. The B-29 scattered itself across about a third of the way up. We circled in close. I never once felt that we were all lost, but I was extremely thankful when I saw the PBY flying over. 12 of us bailed out. Unfortunately, only 11 were picked up. We got this call that a naval TBM had been down and was in the sea to the east of Peleliu. Very difficult to find them because the seas were extremely rough. The swells were 8 to 10 feet. We found them, dropped a smoke bomb, and I called each member of the crew on the intercom to the man. They said, let's go, Skipper. So we got alongside of them. And two of my crewmen, they got a rope to the life raft, and we were able to pull them up to the aircraft. And between all the men on the crew, they were able to get the three men in through the blister of the aircraft. We start to take off run. I hollered, floats up, come back on the wheel just a little bit, and we were airborne. We were very lucky, and I don't mind telling you, I'm not an over-religious man, but God was with us. My name is Doug West. I'm the son of Clyde Allen West. He was a captain and pilot of the B-29 bomber called Dragon Lady. It was actually his final mission, and he was flying Dragon Lady on a bombing mission over Japan. I'm Stephen Wilcoxon, and I'm the son of Roderick Gale Wilcoxon. My dad was flying as co-pilot on the Dragon Lady when she went down. In 1945, General LeMay of the 73rd Bomb Wing and all of the 20th Air Force decreed that incendiary raids should be carried out to successfully stop the production of war material. So incendiary bombing was carried out. It was not a small thing to prep one of those planes for a mission like that. It would start six to eight hours before the mission, and those missions were 15 to 18 hours long. That particular mission, that was a Yokohama raid. They were flying off Northfield Tenyon. That was the same airfield that the Enola Gay and the 509 set up. On their way back, they encountered flak, and it damaged the plane. The shell that damaged them the most exploded right under the cockpit, and it started electrical fires in the airplane, and the airplane was also hit in other places. So they were pretty badly limping. The plane was an electronic airplane, and it was dependent on the internal navigation, radar, and electronic controls. And if the electronic system went out, then you couldn't control the aircraft. They kept turning off the electrical system and it was able to get the fire to stop. But then whenever they tried to turn it back on again, the fire started again. The tail gunner apparently burned alive because of the fire. Right! Everybody else is trying to put the fires out. It's chaos. You have no situational awareness outside the aircraft. And you don't know if you're going to be called on to parachute or whether or not the pilot's going to put her down. 
hole, so he decided to ditch the airplane. You can feel your stomach goes right up in your throat. I mean, you can feel the planes going down like a stone. Descending at 3,000 feet per minute. Level out That's five. a really rapid descent. It would be very close to feeling as if you're in free fall. The noise and the vibration are just tremendous. They're absolutely deafening. And you feel this through your whole body. You want to put her down tail first, smoothly hit the water, and you've got to keep her level. When the plane crashed, several of the crewmen were swept out. Two were lost and never recovered. At that point, because the ship was sinking, they had to get onto their life rafts. They weren't able to radio anybody their location because the electrical equipment had been out. They could count on the fact that somebody was going to be looking for them. They just didn't know how much information the rescuers would have about them because their communications had been cut off. So they were out there floating in the middle of the ocean, probably thinking that this could be the end, that they didn't know whether they were going to be rescued, killed by a uh, Japanese submarine or zeros that may have seen them and come in. You're at zero elevation and everything is above you. You know, you, the Queen Mary could be 100 yards away. And if you weren't on the top of uh, one of the swells, you'd never see it. So it was a scary thing because you just don't know how long you're going to be. How's Weaver? We're out of morphine. She nosed over too quick, Cap. Couldn't get to the provisions. James, any food or water in that thing? Negative, Captain. How long do these rafts stay afloat? They'll hold for a good long while, Verdeshi. Don't you worry. We'll be on Tinian long before these rafts give way. Sam! Sam! Rise and shine, boys! Sam! Why don't you knock that off till another time? You boys up all night playing poker again? Samuel's up! I'm giving you a direct order! Stop working! <laughs> My cousin would never put up with this. You know, the last time you told that story, Doc Holliday was your uncle. Don't start with me, Chief. The operations officer, he got notice from whomever that this was down or that was down, and he's the one that came and notified us that you're on, go. Sam, Lieutenant's on his way. We're going up. Emergency search and rescue. Can you put that back on? Zolka. B-29 ditched, last known position. Go ahead and plot us a course. They're in the water. We're against the clock. Roger that. We got to get those props turned through. Sam! Zuck, you breaking my plane? No, sir. You still looking for a change of scenery? Yes, sir. When you're done there, come aboard. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Check, radio check. Tower check. Radio. Copy. Navigator check. Radar operator. Copy. 
Doc, let's get this thing running. Start on engine number one. Engineer to pilot, copy. Start on engine number one. Start on engine two. Engineer to pilot, copy. Start on engine number two. This is Dumbo number one, requesting clearance for a takeoff on Maple. Emergency rescue, over. Copy, Dumbo. You're currently number one and cleared for takeoff, Maple. Over. Copy, Tower. Pilot to crew, prepare for takeoff. Navigator to pilot, we've reached our last known position. Over. Pilot to navigator, copy. Very nice work, Zalkin. Over. We're going to do an expanded square search. They're out here somewhere. Lieutenant, we're well within fighter range. We're going to have to keep moving when we find them. If we find them. We're not leaving without them, Lieutenant. It's very difficult to find people in a small boat in the ocean. It's just a big ocean out there and a lot of room. And if you make a pass going east to west and turn around and come back the other way, how close are you? Because you can't come back a mile off or two miles off. There were Japanese subs in the area, and the crew members that we was trying to rescue would not be surviving by nightfall. Cap. What is it, Sparks? Cap, you hear it? I think you're hearing things, Cody. No. No, I know that sound. It's a twin engine. Synchronized. One of ours. That's not funny. You know, you should keep your mouth shut if you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, why don't you shut the hell up, Tim, right, Freddy? I know what the hell I heard, all right? It's a twin engine, probably a killer. I know how we was doing, all right? False hope is worse than no false hope. Give people you've been false afraid of guys. Why we're not going to find it? You've been afraid of Maria. Because you don't know where we are. Where are we are? I don't know where we are, but I know where we are. I know where we are. I know where we are. Engineer to pilot, I've got eyes on nine Davy Jones and two good years. Repeat, nine Davy Jones, two good years. Copy, Doc, we've seen them coming around for another pass. What is the condition of the crew, over? One appears to be critical, the other satisfactory, over. One Copy man was pretty badly injured. How far out is that Navy lifeguard sub? ET and playmate, three hours at maximum speed. So Stratton decided to land and pick them up, get them back to the nearest hospital as fast as we could. Pilots and crew prepare for water landing. Floats down, floats down. Copy, floats down, floats down, over. He made an open sea landing, which was prohibitive. It was just too dangerous. He thought of others before he thought of himself. We pulled up to the raft. He was afraid to kill the engine because we had to get out of there as quick as he could. And so the plane was always moving forward. The life raft would float back under the plane when we'd come up. The tail of the plane would be way out of the water and he'd come down slap. Well, he's beating those guys to death in the raft. And so I had to lean out as far as I could over the blister and pull the raft forward against the motion of the plane. Right over, hurry! Oh, boy! 
about zeros. down to the injured guy in the raft. You never saw such a pitiful look on a guy's face in your life. He thought we was gonna go off and leave him. What's your name, Evan? Weaver. My name's Weaver. All right, Weaver, I'm Logan. I need you to work with me for a minute. Can you do that for me, Weaver? I can't move. You have to leave me. We're not going to leave you. Go! You listen to me. We are all going home. Do you understand me? I thought he had a broken back where he was acting. I knew if we brought him over the blister of that plane, we'd kill him. But the pilot was screaming at us. We were in Japanese waters, Logan! sitting ducks, so he wanted us to get off as quick as he could. Logan! <laughs> The plane had the extra weight that we had just taken aboard. And the plane dived, and it hit the base of the next swell. And that swell broke up over the plane, and it ripped the lift prop loose. Stratton pulled the throttle quick enough to keep the other prop from taking us over and down. He had to pull it before the propeller hit him. Probably a hundredth of a second there between this total disaster and us coming out safe. It's unbelievable. I was in the back taking care of the injured people we had taken aboard. The rest of the guys were busy sharpening pencils and sticking them through the rivet holes in the plane because we were shipping water fast. The co-pilot told me Lieutenant Stratton was seriously injured and go for it to take care of him. Our flight surgeon had gone on a trip with another plane and they never returned. So this day, they named me the flight surgeon. One tip of a blade came through the cockpit and hit the pilot just above the ear. It stretched from just over his left ear to the right eye. I looked at it very closely because he would always debrief us when we'd get back from something like this. I took his head in my hands the best I could from the co-pilot's seat. I had to stop the bleeding, but the only way to do it was to put pressure on those blood lines that runs up just in front of your ear on each temple. So I shut down the arteries and the veins at the temple. Now, whether I did any good or not, I don't know. You look out, and as far as you could see, there was these soils coming at you. I got the feeling that I was in the middle of eternity. That's all there was and all there ever had been was that great empty space out there with those swells coming at you. 
And in the meantime, the radio man had been very busy searching for help. And he got in touch with a submarine, the USS Tigrone. And I think it took them an hour or maybe a little more to reach our destination, which they did. So the problem came then to transfer Lieutenant Stratton from the plane to the sub. And they rigged up some kind of a sling and they carried him to the blisters in the back. I outrank you, son. They're gonna ask a lot of questions about today. You just tell them it was a direct order, but I stayed with the ship. You go on with our skipper now. Get him safely across. Put his head to the back. They transported the pilot from the plane to the sub in a sling of some kind. Then the front of the sub pulled up to the plane wing. The nose of the sub was, I'm gonna say, about two or three feet beyond the end of the wing. To get on the sub, we all climbed out of one of the windows of the plane and made our way out on the wing. As the swells came by, we'd go up and down. One moment the sub would be below us, and the next moment it'd rise up above us and then back down. Well, we walked out on the end of the plane wing, and when the sub would start coming up, we'd jump on it. You had to time it just right. It'd go up and come back down, and the next guy jump. All those men on the plane made that transfer safely, for no incident whatsoever. And they'd already taken the wounded guy. Thank goodness we found out later he didn't have a broken back. Come to find out he had a whole bunch of flesh gouged out of one thigh. They got him straightened around pretty well. As I'd been taking care of Lieutenant Stratton, I was next to the last man off the plane. The last man was Captain Zalkin, our navigator. But we all made it safe and sound with no problem. The put-put, it was just a little engine that was pumping water so diligently, it was still chattering away when we all got off and pulled away. And it rose to its finest hour at the time we needed it. So the sub commander unlimbered his deck gun and blew <laughs> playing out of the water. He would have sank it. <laughs> then, tongue-in-cheek, he added it to his tonnage that he was supposed to sink. When we lost it, we felt the loss pretty strongly. He was our old lady, so to speak. Of course, we had a double loss there, you know. We lost the plane to Stratton, too. We thought Stratton was as good a pilot as we could have. We thought he was as good a pilot as there was in the organization. Sometime during the night, Stratton had died. I don't see how he lived as long as he did. I felt like I was inadequate. And the sub's physician, he said there wasn't a thing you could do about it. He said that that had happened on the steps of Johns Hopkins Hospital. It would all have been the same. It's obvious now that nothing, nothing I could have done could have saved Stratton. They buried him at sea the next morning. I was too sick to go. They surfaced. It would have been a, a formal burial at sea. Captain Cassidy, the captain of the Tiger, he would read the burial service, and then the body will be slid over the side of the ship with the crew at attention. Hiram took things on the boat personally. It was done with dignity, respect, and love. The sub picked up a total of about 33 our plane crew, plus the B-29 crew we'd picked up, plus another B-29 crew, and a small medium bomber and one fighter pilot, I believe. I think they had 33 men on the sub, and some of us were sleeping on the torpedo. Uh, that was a record. That was the most pilots and air crew rescued by any lifeguard submarine. And the sub put them ashore on Iwo Jima on June the 1st. 
And there's a picture of them on the deck of the Tigrone when she pulled into Iwo Jima. And there was a famous radio transmission that Cassidy had sent after he had left his lifeguard station to um, Commander-in-Chief submarines and said, Tigrone has saved the Air Force and is returning to Iwo Jima with 28 Zoomies. So we come back for a mission one time, and there was a large group of people around a tent. One of the survivors was telling us what had happened. I got to talk to John Logan, who was a member of that crew, who witnessed all that horrendous stuff. No good. No good. We were transferred to Iwo Jima in May of 1945. We learned that we we're replacing a crew that their service had been lost. And this crew was headed by Lieutenant Royal Stratton and was killed in that operation. I wanted to get down where the action was. And I got the opportunity to uh, volunteer as a co-pilot in the 4th Emergency Rescue Squadron. And I didn't want to be a co-pilot, but that's the way it all worked out. In the long view of things, uh, probably was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> so I was assigned to Captain Richardson's crew, and that very hour, I was on a plane headed for Iwo Jima. I noticed that he had me sit in the pilot's seat. Well, I didn't realize it at the time, but later I found out the reason that I flew in the pilot's seat is because when the prop comes off of that motor, it comes and kills the pilot. So Bud and I became great friends later on after the war and I uh, never ceased to remind him of that fact. And he always blushed up and said, well, uh, you were last in. <laughs> it was the 3rd of July, 1945. I always remember it because I say I got my fireworks a day early. <laughs> i never forget that day. It was, it was, uh, it wasn't good at all. I was a squadron leader on a mission over Chichijima. Richard Schroepel, Dick Schroepel from Ridgewood, New Jersey was my wingman. And I gave a waggle and we all strung out in a string formation, turned our airplanes over, went down and dropped 500 pound bombs on the Japanese landing strip on Chichijima. And they were shooting at me first, but they hit Dick Schroepel. And he got up and bailed out, got into a one-man life raft, got out to sea a little bit. We called for a Dumbo. There was any aircraft on both sides where he went into this bay. Well, he was down inside the bay in his little dinghy, and we got the boat down to him, and the Japanese were all firing at him and firing at us. We were called there, but by the time we got there, another B-17 had dropped his boat. We could see flashes from the shore. An Army PBY landed with a flight surgeon in it. Of course, uh, I was a co-pilot, but that was the first time I'd ever landed in a PBY. I had no experience. To tell you the truth, I thought we were sinking. He saw the rescue boat that was dropped by a B-17. The only thing that I regret, we didn't get the guy. And that, of course, haunts me. He had been killed, and the squadron that replaced my squadron were ordered to use rockets to sink that rescue lifeboat with Dick Scopo's body in it so that the commanding officer of Chichijima wouldn't have another liver to eat of what she was accused of doing after the war. It was a bad day. We were just fortunate that we got out of there and back to Iwo without any more problems. We had some holes in the plane, but they didn't happen to hit anything vital that knocked us down, or we'd have been right down there with him. July the 30th, 1945, the ship was sunk. I first went aboard in February 1942. My name is Lyle Lemonhofer, a seaman first class, and I served aboard the USS Indianapolis. My station was the last one on the back of the ship. The eight-inch guns back aft, that's where I went in to be a gunner's mate. Well, they took us over to Hunter's Point. This huge, big crate was sitting on the dock. So we loaded it aboard ship and put a Marine guard on the door. One of the best kept missions of World War II was USS Indianapolis carrying the atomic bomb to the island of Tinian to be loaded on the Enola Gay. Well, we had no idea what it was or anything like that. MacArthur was over there for a while, and they thought maybe it was a load of toilet paper or something to take to MacArthur. Even on Saipan, we didn't know anything about the mission. 
We went to Guam and we took on ammunition and uh, supplies and things. We left out and the captain requested escort and they turned him down. So we were by ourselves out in the Philippine Sea. And that evening, I had just got off watch at 12 o'clock when the first torpedo hit, it blew off our bow. And then when the second torpedo hit, it hit in our high-octane gasoline in one of our powder rooms where we kept our powder for our ammunition. And it exploded and set fire all through the front of the ship. It was about 12 minutes after midnight when we got hit, and I went in the water. And I didn't see anybody until about 6 o'clock the next morning. There was thousands and thousands of sharks just milling around in Barracuda. We could see them, and they were picking guys that was off by themselves. They were. Just taking them real quick. There's no sound out there, but just a little maybe chopping of a wave or something like that. But then, uh, of course, there was guys talking and crying and praying. We were out there for five days. So we just kept hanging on, saying, well, maybe somebody would spot us or anything. No water, no food. And the Navy didn't report the USS Indianapolis missing until three days later. The fourth day, Wilbur Quinn and his crew, based on Tinian, they were out to spot submarines. And they had put an antenna on the back of the plane and it broke off. So they went back in and picked up another one and came back out again. It started acting up, so Wilbur Quinn, he went back aft and he said, let me take a look at this. They had the bomb bay doors open. He looked down and he saw a oil slick, which was us. And he spotted the heads bobbing up and down. We were splashing and everything. And he said, there's men in the water. So he radioed back in Lieutenant Adrian Marks. His crew was standing by. So he and his crew jumped in the PBY and flew in and he saw sharks. So he made an open sea landing and he bounced a couple of times and popped holes in the plane. And they plugged him up and started taxiing around and started picking up survivors just one at a time. We were all standing in flight D. As a flight leader, I was able to dispatch all three of our airplanes. Lieutenant Richard C. Alcorn went to the northwest. My aircraft went west, and Lieutenant Willie Emmons went to the southwest. Lieutenant Alcorn found them. He landed, and the survivors been in the water without rafts. He threw them rafts full of water and canned food, or rations, rather. Some of them ended up in rubber rafts, floundering, and I swam out and grabbed it and swam to our airplane. The surface craft reached them a little bit just before dark. A Navy PBM landed and gave them more water and more rafts. I was picked up probably about 8 o'clock from the PBY, and that's when they sent a boat over to pick us up from the USS Cecil Doyle. They gave us a soup, a sandwich. It was good. That was our first meal. I don't even know what it was. Probably shark. <laughs> Almost 1,200 men aboard ship, and there was only 317 of us that survived. We didn't know anything about the atomic bomb. It was a well-kept secret. We didn't even know what the mission was, but they called the mission, and we took off 5 o'clock in the morning, and we had number one station, which is right off the coast of Japan. It was a beautiful day. It was clear blue sky, maybe a cloud here and there once in a while, smooth sailing, and we was going along there, and all of a sudden, George, radio operator, sat across from me. He looked out the window, and he see this cloud coming up, and he said, what the hell was that? And I stood up and looked out the top hatch, and he could see this cloud getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We didn't see the flash, because I don't think we were that close. I do recall we felt the shock of it blowing out. It just came over the radio a short time later that it was uh, what they call the atomic bomb. It was horrendous. We didn't know at the time how many thousands of people it had killed, but it was just something I was not very proud of. We had a mission to the number one station. There were three men downed right in the center of Tokyo Bay. So I immediately started my descent. Finally, we got through the flak. 
I spotted the three survivors. We made a full stall landing, but I overshot them by about a half a mile. I had to turn around, taxi back to them. The destroyer come out. They were firing five-inch shells at us. They were coming closer every shell. Finally, one dropped in between the starboard wing and the aft tail section, knocked my medical technician off his feet, told him to close the hatches, get ready to take off. When the windshield cleared up, I could see I was headed straight for that destroyer. I yelled, pull up the float so I could start a turn, even though I was on the water. I finally got airborne, and I went right across the bow of that destroyer. On August 15th, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, we got the notice that the Japanese had surrendered. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. Ceasefire was to be 12 noon. When we arrived at the station, it was circling four destroyers. They said they were picking up bogeys on their radar screen. No sooner said that, the sky turned black with all the anti-aircraft fire from all four ships. There was a kamikaze attack. Five zeros were coming in. Four of them went after the destroyers. One picked me out to Ramos. He was flying through the flak, waving his wings, adjusting so he could ram me head on. He got to about maybe 50 yards. I could see the pilot as clearly as I'm looking at you. I thought, Sure, th this was the end of my life. Just at that point, one of the shells from the destroyer must have hit the bomb this kamikaze was flying with, just blew up in a huge ball of flame. I didn't even see the wreckage. That was my most frightening experience, more so than landing in Tokyo Bay. I was up at Japan when Admiral Hosea came on and said for all pilots to return to base that the war was over and the Japanese had surrendered. And then one of the worst six hours in my life of flying, my father had taken me to see the movie All Quiet on the Western Front, where the guy gets plugged the last day of the war. And I thought, oh shit, uh, this is gonna happen, we're gonna get lost, something bad's gonna happen. And that's the way I thought all the way back to evil. Near the end of the war, we lost one aircraft with seven guys shut down, it hit us pretty bad, particularly when just hours away from the end of the war. The last plane shot down on World War II was a PBY, 4th Emergency Rescue Squadron, in Tokyo Bay. We got a mission to fly a courier to the battleship Missouri. The courier was carrying the surrender documents. I was co-pilot on that flight. Charles Oates was the pilot. The courier and I decided to play the cribbage on the way. I could see the outline of the document binders in his mail bag. The courier wouldn't let go of that bag the entire flight, obviously for good reason. We are gathered here, representatives, of the major warring powers to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The issues involving divergent ideals and ideologies have been determined on the battlefields of the world.
I announce it my firm purpose in the tradition of the countries I represent to proceed in the discharge of my responsibilities with justice and tolerance while taking all necessary dispositions to ensure that the terms of surrender are fully, promptly, and faithfully complied with. We didn't dream of anybody getting killed. We were friends. When you lose a friend, you lose a part of yourself. We had built a theater on Saipan where we could watch movies at night and named it the Stratton Memorial Theater, which proved what the gentlemen of the squadron felt about Royal. Unfortunately, he lost his life, but it's because of that that I'm here today, my family is here, several generations of family are here because of, of the efforts of Stratton and his crew. So words escape me as to the gratitude that I have for the gentleman. Understanding the dynamic of the young soldier, the hero is born just from circumstance. He's pushed into a circumstance. It's the decision he makes at that moment that makes him the hero. And some of them don't survive those decisions. I'm here. I was born in 52. I was born way after this event. So I'm lucky to be here, and I'm lucky that the legacy goes on and that these things are documented and we remember. You know, when somebody is taken away from you so young, that's the way you remember them forever. You don't see them getting old and cranky and losing their hair and, you know, he was always 22 in her mind. It's hard to imagine the reverberations of, of somebody, you know, a very beloved family member, a community member, a friend that um, is not here anymore. My son was killed in Iraq in April of 2004. The Cindy Sheehan that existed on April 3rd didn't exist on April 4th. It was a totally different person. We got the knock on the door and the, the army came to tell us that Casey was killed. I fell on the floor screaming for I don't know how long until my head hurt, until my heart hurt. And when I got up, I was a different person. How could I not be? Sorry. One of my limbs was amputated. What is hard is to see how my mom reacted. She never got over the death of my dad, ever. You, you mentioned his name, and she started crying. So it was something that I never really wanted to get to because it just tore her up too much. She loved him till the day she died. I like that old saying that says, a person never dies until the last person that remembers that person dies. So I don't think Casey's ever gonna die. He's, uh, his story and our story is written up in history books and um, has made that, that Casey is actually immortal. It's Congress's responsibility and our honor to call attention to those who have uh, given meritorious service to our country. And certainly, um, the Congress recognized the importance of those who have served in World War II. Uh, we've honored them with a special memorial. And we know that uh, those who served are, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, many of them are starting to answer uh, their, their last uh, call to duty. And we want to take every opportunity to be able to come forward for those individuals who have served and pay them special recognition. Rise in honor of World War II rescue pilot, First Lieutenant Royal Stratton, who died May 29, 1945, after being mortally wounded while saving nine crew members from a downed B-29. Royal hailed from Elwood City, Pennsylvania. His love of flying led to his enlistment in the Army Air Corps, where he excelled to become one of the few pilots to wear both Army and Navy wings. Royal joined the 4th Emergency Rescue Squadron with his crew of six who fly off Iwo Jima in police flight paths searching for B-29 bombers of Jeffrey. Generations have passed since the members of the 4th Emergency Rescue Squadron set foot on these shores. It doesn't seem that long ago that they started out on their journey and faced an entire world at war. This remote island of Iwo Jima is the last place on Earth a pilot from Pennsylvania and many others would set foot. 
And it's this hallowed ground that I've chosen as the last stop on my journey as well. Here atop Mount Suribachi, I'm alone with the memory of those brave individuals who forever set aside everything they could have been in the name of freedom. And they changed the world. Many of us didn't know my great uncle, just the name, Royal A. Stratton. He was one among millions, but he was ours. I think back fondly about all the roads I've taken on this long journey reaching back through time. But in all my travels, I've found none so cherished as the road that leads us home. Loads up. We're going home. It's been a good life that we've had. We've had positive experiences. We've had a positive attitude. What legacy do we want to leave behind? You know, we want to leave a, a legacy of peace and harmony all over the world. I just wanted to do my part. I tried my best to do everything they asked of me, and uh, I got through. We're out there to save lives rather than to take lives. I feel great knowing that we were part of a group trying to rescue survivors. You can't imagine the feeling that you have inside as you and these men saved those lives. Everyone took pride in what they did, and it's a real happy feeling. I was just pleased that that's what I'd been chosen to do. I've had a terrific life. I wouldn't trade anybody for mine. Well, you don't salute without your hat. Best year of your life. You don't realize it until they're over. <laughs>